Next up, we're warping into handheld territory, ladies and gentlemen. Mega Man 1 through 5, aka Rockman World 1 through 5, all for the Game Boy by Capcom, on whose behalf it was developed by Minakuji Engineering, that's 1, 3, 4, and 5. And in the case of 2, Japan System House, aka Biox, circa 1991 through 94. Ferguson, my 16-bit comrade, you have the floor. Ugh. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks for having me on board. Let's get those Mega Busters out and start blasting away. Set, as always, during various points between 2000X and 20XX like their NES ancestors, the Big Dr. W is up to even more horseshit. As many might expect, resurrecting all his once-fallen Robot Master servants by any means necessary, whether it's via his new set of schematics, time travel, shore drills, or display case reprogramming thefts at an expo, to pursue and do away with the titular Blue Bomber protagonist yet again. And here's the catch. Not only are each of the pre-existing Robot Masters featured in the first four handheld subseries taken from the original five NES offerings, except for Gutsman, Bomb Man, Gravity Man, Wave Man, Star Man, and friggin' Gyro Man, each new Robot Killer is introduced per entry, about which we'll be eventually touched upon. In the fifth outing's case, an all-new enigmatic attack robot from outer space makes its appearance in the form of Terra, leader of the Star Droids, hence this particular offerings eight new bosses, all named after the first eight planets in the solar system, with the exception of one which, prior to 2006, was considered an actual planet, but was questioned status-wise due to a discovery of several objects of similar size in the Kuiper Belt, but once again, I digress. Anyways, during an intense confrontation between old Mega and Terra, it turns out that the former standard arm cannon's effectiveness is worth fuck all. <laughs> Therefore, his little blue ass is knocked out, and the latter announced android antagonist Cadre of Invaders brew up their own brand of shitstorms like never before, just like the previous four, and especially their analogous NES foregoers. <laughs> Who else but Mega is capable of rising up to these myriads of struggles, right? Only this time, he's equipped with a new Mazinger inspired Mega Arm. Regarding the gameplay, you know the drill. They're yet again identical to its console counterparts, except each new innovative ability and or change is added per outing. An all-new exclusive item, the carry platform for guiding Mega Man to higher areas and even avoiding hazardous areas, is introduced in Dr. Wily's Revenge upon wiping out the last Robot Master. Sliding, rush adapters, and E-tanks for 2 and onward, except the rush coil, is available upon the demise of Crash Man in Mega Man 2 alone. Mega Buster charged shots for 3 and onward, with the Rush Marine completely nixed from the roster again. You're able to access Dr. Light's lab at various points in both 4 and 5 to purchase more items, like extra E-tanks, weapon tanks, and the like, depending on how many P-chips you've accrued. And every time you unleash a more vigorous and desolating Mega Buster charge shot, you'll always end up gravitating a pace or two back, or propel your retracting fist as a replacement of said offensive projectile, respectively, with the latter shitting, shitting uncontrollably on the hard knuckle in 3. three. So good. In addition, Beat also makes his return in the fourth portable offering, summoned by discovering and nabbing all four letters spelling out the bird's name in the corresponding Mega Man 4 Robot Master stage areas, and even granting access to Wily's newest fortress by also discovering more letters that spell out his own name in the other Robot Master stage areas, hailing from and based on Mega Man 5. 
Speaking of debuts, how can we possibly forget about the robotic feline Tango? Just like with the Rush Coil and the NES offerings, he's pre-equipped from the get-go, and he serves as combat backup like Beat does in terms of his Sonic-like cannonball ricocheting maneuvers, though he never made a return in future installments. Not, Not counting, counting 10. 10! Getting to these all-new robot killers, they are confronted at specific points, mainly following the execution, or in Blade Runner terms, retirement, of the latter four robot masters hailing from every future NES offering, and their respective weapons are annexed to your arsenal depending on which game you're dealing with. There's Anchor and Dr. Wily's Revenge, a knight-like droid whose spirit can absorb your arm cannon shots and deflect them back in the form of either a diminutive or a colossal barrier wave. Quentin Chapter 2, a utopian future version of Mega and Boomerang Visor and Shades, sporting nothing but an attack pogo jackhammer. Punk in Chapter 3, an armored droid with the ability to transform into a buzzsaw-like wheel and lob deadly saw orbs. And finally in Chapter 4, Belade, an all-new creation of Wily's who isn't anything like the other three, the latter of which you have to confront twice, with the second form making a much more convincing appearance, no less. Each will fly you the Mirror Buster, the very same Saku Garne Pogo Jackhammer, Screw Crushers, and the Blade Cracker Bombs individually, and are all mandatory for the final battle with Wily and his countless devices of mass destruction and doomsday, located in his own fortresses, bases, and stations away from or on Earth, and throughout the cosmos alike. In other words, you'd be an even deeper shit if you weren't fully equipped and ready. Must we mention that they also reappear not only in the fifth fucking offering, but also in 10 on WiiWare slash PSN slash Xbox Live Arcade? Another myriad of isolated incidents, we know. While well, more than capable of keeping the former two at bay, namely the aforestated Anchor, notwithstanding his erratic and shit patterns, you either make a large leap or jump twice, run non-stop across the room, or a hybrid of the aforementioned, and especially that pussy-ass bitch Quint, not to mention make short-ass work of the multi-phased Wily Machine variations in the first three outings. The latter two, however, including the sort of piss-easy punk, will all but guarantee they'll have a titanium coffin erected and etched in your name like it's no one's Christ forsaken beeswax. Other than the appearances of the Robot Masters, who behave about the same way when you confront them in their original NES counterparts, the earlier established Star Droids in the fifth outing are pretty much in the same difficulty range, and once again, by now, you, you pretty, pretty much get, get the, the gist, gist of them. them. As always, should you manage to put those elusive resilient cum buckets out of commission, their new batch of weapons become available to you, just like those of the Masters and the new Quartet of Killers alike. <laughs> Mercury's Grab Buster, Neptune's Salt Water, Mars's Photon Missile, Venus's Bubble Bomb, Jupiter's Electric Shock, Saturn's Black Hole, Pluto's Break Dash, Uranus's Deep Digger. <laughs> Seriously, guy. By the way, this variability is akin to Gutsman's Super Arm in the first NES outing. And Terra's Spark Chaser. In tandem with the penultimate four, however, there are special hidden crystals in their respective domains, and definitely not the ones intended for Gamma, no siree, Bob, for you to nab in order to unlock a special item which, almost akin to the energy balancer in 6 on the NES, reduces your overall weapon usage by half. Of course, there are other mandatory weapon enhancements about which will be further elaborated. Control-wise, they're all top-notch given the fluidity of the Blue Bomber's rudimentary actions in spite of the traditional gripes about which won't be reiterated, barring the minimal stage maneuvering space given the handheld screen area. And the gameplay procedure is far from a pain in the balls to get the hang of, as usual, considering the additional side quests in which you're able to partake of your own free will. Goddamn, dude, you really said a mouthful there. Challenge-wise, as expected, the first three of the five handheld offerings run the gamut from Mickey Mouse territory to somewhat standard, stage structure-wise and adversary confrontation-wise. The latter two, however, hog my hooter and kiss my ass on Groundhog Day, contain certain elements that'll drive you up the motherfucking wall faster than both Jack Burton's Porkchop Express Semi from Big Trouble in Little China and Lincoln Hawk's trucks and the infamous Over the Top combined. It's not so much about the earlier reference target Robot Masters, the Quartet of Killers, and Star Droids you're pursuing, let alone the debut of Giant Susie in 3, whom you have to confront twice for the record, or Wily himself, no less. It's getting to them that's the main gripe, well, at least in the case of the second half of the third handheld outing and onward. Take all the corresponding Wily fortresses in 3, 4, and 5, for instance. Just like in Mega Man 2 on both systems, the Rush Jet is mandatory for most of the spike infested sections, and even those of bottomless pits. And you definitely have to watch your ass in the trash compactor areas while blasting your way through all the cubes of junk and random mets that occupy them, and even avoiding their own spike infested areas. And don't even get us started with the Bomb Cow platforms in 3, either, which are featured in 6 and onward, by the by. Just haul ass upon setting them off by landing. Nothing to it. Concerning 4 and 5, not only do you have to also face Ballet twice prior to reaching that Wily Jackass in both his Space Fortress Satellite Cannon and the all-new Iron Golem Machine, prior to which you have to confront Pharaoh Man, Ring Man, Bright Man, Toad Man, Stowed Man, Napalm Man, Crystal Man, and Charge Man yet again, there's also more mechanical menaces you have to contend with in 5. 
a yellow devil inspired being known as dark moon prior to facing the last four star droids two giant fists each with eyes before which you have to cream all eight star droids yet again and the wily machine brain crusher variation complete with a gravity reversal droid and ticking time bombs the latter of which are used to harm said machine <laughs> Followed by the end-all, be-all reigning commander and last of the Star Droids, Sunstar, who, unlike the previous eight, shows absolutely no mercy whatsoever in two phases. And mark our goddamn words, be prepared to get lost in the world of shit with these relentless sons of bitches. Cause they'll tear out your skull, hammer it to pieces on the most solid pedestal nearby, and shove every single fragment so far up your ass that you won't be able to go number two for a year and a half! <laughs> Remember those new enhancements I mentioned earlier? You can, however, make things easy on yourself by purchasing them from Dr. L. The Magnet Hand, the Level 2 Mega Arm, aka the Clabber Arm, and the Returning Item Replicator from 4, with the former two being in-game exclusives, great for nabbing hard reach items from a distance, and scoring more hits on even the toughest of boss adversaries individually, provided again, you've racked up enough P-chips in each stage. As always, starting out with two lives, more of which can be found and acquired on a whim, or constantly farming your ass off, and Infinite continues. Not only is the password system varied between each outing, specifically a 4x4 dot grid in 1, 2, and 3, and a letter-based grid in 4 and 5, 6x4 with alphabetical letters on the x-axis and numbers on the y-axis, and 5x5, respectively. And while the grid letters signify those of the supporting characters in 4, like R for Rush, E for Eddie, and B for Beat, with T for Tango replaces Beat in 5, the same perseverance and strategic fact <coughs> you mean strategic tact in terms of patience and observation apply here as well. Therefore, we strongly suggest referring back to the NES counterparts whenever possible. That we do, man. And none of that ditto drive crap like we've been doing time and time again. Your thoughts on the graphics, Bergeson? Identical yet again to their original console parents, taking the monochrome hues and screen ratio limitations into consideration for all five. They do more than stand out among all the rest, if not on the same wavelength. Granted, the fifth outing does contain its own set of hues judging from its compatibility with that new accessory, the Super Game Boy, but regardless of your desired palette choice, every main, supporting, and opposing character alike are decently represented in each correlating handheld installment. Sure, each of the backgrounds aren't virtually spot on by comparison, nor are they suitable enough for casual types, but at least the outsourced development teams on Capcom's behalf, namely the earlier cited Minakuchi Engineering of Solar Striker, Wily Wars MMX3 fame, and Biox, formerly Japan System House of Streets of Rage 1 and 2 on Master System and Game Gear, Kid Nikki 2 and 3 on Famicom, and Kung Fu Master on Game Boy fame for Irem, had to devise something original while staying true to the main series' stage structures. While most of the new areas based on their respective console relatives are unique to some extent, if a hair out of whack in some places, I'm looking at you, Woodman! The stage areas in the fifth handled offering don't disappoint even a single solitary smidgen whatsoever, nor do the outer space areas. Of course, very few might end up being turned the hell off regarding the latter, but they're anything but redundant, surprisingly. The beginning, midpoint, and end cutscenes are far from total eyesore-inducing blemishes as well. Bottom line, consider this my final reiteration of how diverse, meticulous, and mind-blowing the presentations are for each outing, given the handheld's limited capabilities. Make that our final reiteration. In terms of music and sound, arranged for all five games by Makoto Tomozawa, of Aladdin for the Super NES, The Great Circus Mystery with Mickey, the PS1 Saturn and PC ports of X3, later the Resident Evil AK Biohazard series, Dino Crisis 1 and 2, Product Number 03, or PNO3 for short, and Mega Man Legends 1 and 2 fame, Kenji Yamazaki for 2, of Kid Nikki 2 and 3 for the Famicom, Ninja Gaiden and Fantasy Star Adventure on Game Gear, the latter a Japan-only release, and Superman on Genesis fame for Sunsoft, and finally Koji Murata, alias Yagiyama, of Magic Sword on Super NES, Bionic Commando also also on Game Boy and Wily Wars fame, all based on their respective NES counterparts, with the exception of the second and fifth offerings. The diverse yet familiar variations of all the classic scores are spot on, notwithstanding the few alterations, at least in the case of Dr. Wily's Revenge, and especially 3 and 4. The scores in the second offering, however, that's another case entirely. As unique as they are, and clear as they reality, they leave a hell of a lot to be desired. Percussion and channel instrumentation-wise, it's a scotch too abrasive, monotonous, and cathartic for even the most casual gamers, that is, as opposed to all the rest. At least the choices of tracks in the fifth outing don't disappoint, and aren't as third-rate as the likes of Mega Man 2, nor are the corresponding sound effects, which, like it's not obvious already, are engineered with a different approach. On the extreme ladder, sure they can be somehow annoying at times, looking at you again, Mega Buster charge-ups. <laughs> But are far from absolute ear rape alley, including most notably Tango's meowing when called upon. And as ever, take note of our top five songs per offering shown here, with a few honorable mentions on top of that.
gameplay value, Bergerson? At this juncture, there's honestly jack shit else to further comment on regarding these five. While the second offering isn't much to write home about as opposed to all the others, and as long as you're able to look past the oversimplified design choices in conjunction with the relative semi-ease of Dr. Wily's Revenge and Mega Man 2 especially, not to mention rethink your methodical approaches in the cases of 3, 4, and 5, and even take the alternate paths and optional enhancement items into account, you'll be desiring nothing else but to be shifting gears every now and again into the Mega Man Game Boy, aka Rockman World, Pentology. Bottom line, you'd be doing yourself a reprehensible ass disservice by turning down either or any of them, if the entire lineup... Ain't that the truth, Citizen Ruth? Thought you'd seen it all? Think again! Cause 16-bit Shangri-La, here we come! Mega Man X 1, 2, and 3, aka Rockman X 1, 2, and 3, alongside Classic 7, I know I don't own the latter, all circa 93 through 95, with the penultimate being developed on Capcom's behalf by the very same Minakuchi Engineering. Unlike the main original series, this and its successors were set in 21 XX, a century following that of the classics, during which a recent dickhead ensued. Amongst the abandoned remains of the long-deceased Dr. Light was none other than an unusual capsule within which the titular protagonist's prototype was discovered, a robot that could reason and think for himself, not to mention accomplish all kinds of shit that no other robot, let alone no other human being, ever could. Step aside, Proto-Man. Salvaged and adopted by archaeologist Dr. Kane, another robot of his was designed and brought to life by him, notwithstanding the features about which he was unable to comprehend, but was more than able to mass-produce the standardized duplicates of X without fail. Those were known as Reploids, or Replicants Androids for short, who harbor the same purposes as X, but at a risk. While they're provided with not only the intent of serving humankind, but mainly the earlier recounted free will for reasoning, logical thinking, and the like, a high possibility of criminal rebellion doesn't seem to stray too far from it. Due to this, many law-abiding citizens would label them as Mavericks, otherwise known as Irregulars in Japan. Speaking of which, a Reploid turned Maverick assaulted a human worker on the proclamation that his kind is superior to their creators, thereby resulting in his immediate execution, likewise with the other Reploids turned Mavericks. It's no wonder why Dr. Kane had no crystal clear idea that he's created what the Late Light had feared the most, an artificial race with no conscience whatsoever notwithstanding the free will they've been provided, but with a myriad of chaotic results, hence why he's not as brilliant as the likes of Light despite their shockingly equal IQs. Ergo, the Maverick Hunter squads were developed and dispatched under the leadership of Sigma. Remember that other robot that Kane engineered? While these newly formed MH squads dealt with every Maverick incident in spite of the heavy losses they've suffered, it's like they were truly capable of keeping those dark-hearted motherfuckers in check, and then some. In spite of this, however, Sigma himself also goes Maverick in the process, as does the rest of his 8-unit brigade, specifically Chill Penguin, Flame Mammoth, Boomer Koanger, Sting Chameleon, Spark Mandrill, Storm Eagle, Armored Armadillo, and Lodge Octopus thus seizing control of a diminutive faraway island, forcing out all its human inhabitants as proclamation of their inferiority to the Reploids and Mavericks, and later putting forth a plot to rid said island of all humanity, alongside with his followers. <laughs> what bastards! Anyhow, in response to this, X, possessing a strong, unbreakable sense of determination, made his intention as clear as Grey Goose Vodka to once and for all put an expeditious standstill to the Maverick mayhem his successors started in the first place, including that of their renegade commander, Sigma. Little does he know, he's not alone, for another determinist fuck Maverick Hunter, harboring the same goal as out there, willing to put his ass on the line for all humanity and good-natured reploids alike. Gameplay-wise, who the Christ could've guessed? It's basically the same procedure as the classics from which this spawned, but with a twist. In true Shatterhand fashion, there's a mandatory intro stage area you're tasked with progressing through as you would for any other typical area, following which the tried-and-true quote-unquote attempt one of the eight bosses stage areas in any desired order procedure comes into play. 
In this particular case, you're on a partly damaged highway, occupied by a new, if sometimes all too familiar, heap of enemies struggling to reach an apprentice maverick merc on Sigma's behalf. Spinning spiky wheels with spikes and various mechanoloid menaces, including robust gun vaults, road smashing crushers, bomb beams, ball de vu walkers, jammingers, and road attackers up the ass. And don't even get us started with those insolent ass missile and machine gun armed beep laters either, two of which have to confront no less, let alone the deteriorating highway structures, which do so upon landing halfway through. Following all this mayhem comes the first of few encounters with that very same Maverick Merc motherfucker, namely the dreaded Vile, boarding a ride armor, during which, and against whom, your standard X-Buster does dick all, normal or charged. Either way, you're left with no other recourse but to give in to his motives, both physical and verbal, thus nearly getting your ass killed off in the process. <laughs> And then the inevitable turnaround ensues. Remember that other determined Maverick Hunter I was raving about earlier? The blonde ponytailed, red clad Lone Wolf Zero steps in to teach that cunt rag son of a bitch Vile a lesson, damaging his right armor in the process and thereby forcing his cocky ass to retreat. Despite X's self doubts, limited capabilities, and overall strength, Zero, showing an outpouring of compassion and encouragement, convinces him to further his intended goal of not only pursuing and eradicating the ever loving fuck out of the earlier recounted Sigma, but his eight anthropomorphic Maverick disciples, hence the next batch of phases. Remember that traditional 8 stage path I discussed earlier? Instead of robot masters, we now have 8 maverick menaces to seek out and slaughter the piss out of. Again, everything's hereditary from here, except not only are you capable of firing off and charging up your X Buster, aka this series own Mega Buster, via Y by default, you can also leap up or slide down walls to your circuit's contempt and make rapid dashes, but only with the introduction of one of the four armor enhancements found in light semi hidden capsules throughout half of the Maverick stage areas, B and A respectively, again by default, or tapping left or right twice in the latter ability's case. And while your energy meter starts out a hell of a lot smaller than normal, you can extend it even higher by obtaining hard tanks in all 8 of these areas, as well as discover sub tanks to refill said meter, akin to the E tanks in the classics. Of course, they have to be pre supplied by nabbing said hearts or the usual large and small refill items, if mostly the latter. In addition, whenever you nab any weapon refill, a random previously used one will be replenished. While a handful of the stage specific sub bosses are in spring picking territory, including but strictly not limited to the aforementioned B bladers in the first opening stage, the giant Utsuboro Serpent in Launch Octopus's domain, and the Mold Borer in Armored Armadillo's domain, others will make you their crack horror in no time flat, including the Cycloptic, Heavyset RT 55J Attack Humanoid in Stink Chameleon's domain, the Thunder Slimer in Spark Mandrel's facilities, and both the beastly as fuck and Glurge Assault Sub in the heavily armed to the Gills Cruiser ship, also in Launch Octopus's aquatic domain. And by this point, we all know where this is going. Getting to your main target lineup of 8 Mavericks, whose names I suggest referring back to, all of whom are in charge of the areas they reign, an arctic site, a steel factory, a high power defense fortress, a wilderness landscape, a power plant, an airport and its accompanying airship, an underground facility, and the underwater base individually, not to mention the countless troops of hostile parties that inhabit them, including but not limited to the traditional Mets and yet another spin on the Sniper Joes, except with Chain Maces, whose names and faces will go unmentioned for the sake of time. Again, consider them this series' new robot masters, as their own set of weaponized abilities become available to you upon their demise, swapped around at will via start or LNR on the fly, likewise in the other X titles, and especially Classic 7, 8, and onward. Not to mention, they serve other purposes besides making short work of even the toughest foes. For instance, the boomerang cutter retrieves items from near impossible areas. And remember those armor enhancement capsules I indicated earlier? The boots for the earlier established dashing, helmet for breaking blocks and advanced durability, body armor for reducing enemy damage by half, and level 2 X Buster for unleashing more intense and OP to his boss firepower, and also providing your special weapons a massive immense edge beyond compare, discovered in the domains of Chill Penguin, Storm Eagle, Stink Chameleon, and Flame Mammoth individually. While not mandatory for the latter half of the game, are a vital necessity for reaching near impossible areas, as well as making every confrontation a summer picnic, thereby beefing up the replay value in a way no one's ever dreamed of. 
As expected, upon clearing all 8 areas, and even having every semi-mandatory item throughout no less, the 4th phase Sigma Fortress Infiltration Initiative takes place. And before I forget once again, certain environmental disasters can and will occur depending on which stage you've conquered beforehand. A few notable examples include Flame Mammoth's Factory gone sub-zero upon making Chill Penguin your bottom bitch, Spark Mandrel's facilities being struck to dick all by Storm Eagle's airship on autopilot upon exterminating the fearless feathered fuckface, thereby turning near pitch black, and even Stink Chameleon's forest area flooded due to the demise of Launch Octopus. Rudimentary info and intel squared away, the overall control schematics are near flawless in every comprehensive aspect, and outdo those of its foregoers thanks entirely to the boundless deal of exhilarating freedom stemming from the drastically augmented abilities and item discovery procedures going hand in hand with each other. And must I mention yet again how anything but complicated and nerve wracking the traditional tried and true gameplay framework is? Regarding its challenge, in comparison to that of the classic series, the original X is well balanced in that no common, if somehow unfamiliar, hurdle is too much of either a walk in the park or a stubborn, soulless, star-graving bitch to acquaint yourself with. Either way, expect more of the latter, as most of the shit you'll endure in Sigma's 4 Quadrant Domain doesn't compare, and mark my fucking words, does NOT COMPARE to what the 8 Maverick Managed Stages had to offer. Oh Christ, no! Not only do you have to deal with more of the standard dickhead foes you've been contending with all along, the same 8 Maverick bosses make it another myriad of comebacks as you're forced to deal with their asses once again sporadically in a predetermined order, akin to the original classic entry, starting with Boomer Kuangra in the first area after yet again confronting Vile from earlier, not just in his right armor, as always, which for the record, you can board in certain stages unlike the one he travels and attacks in, and you can wipe out the pilot before his vindictive ass jumps in. Therefore, expect the same benefit in the later sequels, but also on foot, following the climactic struggle between him and Zero, resulting in the unexpected, untimely demise of the latter supporting character upon that of the former opposing boss, at which point he'll award you that very same X-Buster enhancement if you didn't have it already, followed by Chill Penguin and Storm Eagle in the second area, with the remaining 5 in the third, not to mention next to last, area. With the exception of the previously indicated final confrontation against Vile, there are three end-stage bosses you'll be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with in each fortress area before reaching their ruthless Maverick leader. As such, our gargantuan mechanoloid boss spider whose internal weak point is briefly visible upon its post-claim landing while it occasionally unleashes his offspring. Rangda Bangda, a room made up of a pair of artificial eyes that discharges certain projectiles depending on the pupil colors when open, either red, green, or blue, not to mention a rocket-propelled nose that operates with the opposite walls almost closed in halfway, and Aurora Spikes on the bottom, all of which are possible weak points except for the latter, and D-Rex, a humongous yellow and purple jot tank that separates itself in two and charges at its target, either parallel to each other or in a randomized zigzag pattern before halting, oftentimes causing quakes and releasing an energy orb before fusing back together once again. While I'm more than capable of annihilating Rangda Bangda, both the Boss Spider and D-Rex can FUCK, fuck RIGHT THE, the Christ, CHRIST OFF, mostly due to the former's preset randomized path it arranges before climbing all the way down, often, if rarely, resulting in a sudden collision with the arachnid asshat, in which case, always position yourself the hell away before landing a hit with a shotgun ice, and the latter's constant wall collisions and massive energy discharges, resulting in probable damage and distraction, shit, guts me in much? In which other case, the same solution applies, except there's a lot of evasive maneuvering involved that must be taken into utmost consideration in tandem with staging a counteroffensive. And yes, they also apply during the occasional mid-stage subboss and maverick confrontations, with or without your armor enhancements. Upon finally facing both Sigma and his pet Felguard, the latter of whose altercation occurs first, and is also susceptible to the shotgun ice, be prepared for the struggle of your natural born life, as the former indicated main antagonist appears in two forms, both as a formidable saber toting gladiator. <laughs> and a massive, gigantic, wolf-like mechanoloid, complete with two claw platforms that discharge energy or make abrupt falls, at which point you can actually leap your way atop one of them, as well as two types of offenses, a flamethrower and a spark orb volley. As always, should you happen to make it this far, you deserve a fucking medal. And while we're at it, there's one secret capsule that many have been raving about time and time again. Near the ass end of Armored Armadillo stage, be sure you've killed yourself off enough times while in full armor upon jumping off the double-pointed minecart platform and wall jump to the ledge above the Maverick boss's chambers. And within said capsule lies the holographic Dr. Light, as usual. Cosplaying as Ryu? Seriously? Anyways, he'll award you with the Hadouken ability, inspired by the iconic Street Fighter technique. Great for exterminating every foe in one hit. One fucking hit! Or more in some cases. 
Take note, you have to be at full energy and on the ground before performing it. Other than that, bear in mind each and every word to the wise I've provided thus far, and then some. Unless you're asking to have your freedom fighting, maverick hunting, reploid ass being crushed in a city junk and sent back home in a goddamn duffel bag. Before I forget, there's a 12 digit number based password system with which you can continue your progress, and yes, it even applies to the armor enhancements, sub tanks, and life extension hearts you've gotten a hold of so far. Graphically, Capcom has truly outdone themselves yet again, gracing us with its flawlessly crystal clear and meticulous attention to detail in terms of the much augmented background themes, in conjunction with the sprites of all the main and supporting characters, as well as their opposing hostile parties. The essential animations for said sprites have been vastly improved, not to mention those of the participating environmental effects and situational occurrences whenever any and all foes get eliminated, and that's to be expected from any 16-bit update to a popular franchise. X himself, both with and without his armor, is a sight to behold beyond all expectations, no matter what trials and tribulations him and Zero go through, thanks to a stalwart, authentic attitude. The most notable backgrounds, of which there are many, fitting the themes of all the Maverick areas, including but not limited to Launch Octopus's ocean base, with the transparent effects in the underwater surroundings annexed to boot, are way more than just the tip of the iceberg. Likewise with approximately one quarter of the Mavericks who will cost along the way, whose body parts fall off upon using Quanger's boomerang cutter on them, specifically Flame Mammoth's trunk and Launch Octopus's tentacles, thereby negating their abilities to pull off any extra offenses, and in the long run, earning yourself the upper hand as it were. Despite the latter feature being nixed in the up and coming sequels, it's fortunately not that much of a gripe. All in all, in spite of the occasional slowdown that takes place upon the downfall of various large scale main bosses or during other inopportune cases, radiant visuals are radiant. Music and sound wise, with the aforementioned Alf Lila, Capcom's in house band, made up of not only Takehara and Tomozawa, but three others alongside them, namely their main initial lead composer, Tetsuo Yamamoto of Street Fighter 2 Dash Special Champion Edition, Final Fight 2 and Mighty Final Fight, X Men Mutant Apocalypse, also on Super NES, Mega Man The Power Battle and Power Fighters, Street Fighter Alpha 1 and 2, Rival Schools, and Pocket Fighter, aka Super Gem Fighter Mini Mix fame, with Toshiko Horiyama, later of X4 fame, and Yuki Iwai, the latter of whom not only arranged and composed the soundtrack for this game's sequel, but was also known for the Versus series, except Marvel vs. Capcom and onward, taking the helm. The soundtrack is nothing short of phenomenal and notable, as each song heard throughout boasts that hard rock infused power metal element, which vastly shits and jizzes all over those of the classics in just about every conceivable way, one of which involves very closely tying in with the atmosphere of each and every stage X traverses and clashes his way the hell through, not to mention all the bosses that he faces. Zero's separate set of themes, both of his paradigmatic crusade, and eventual downfall heard at various in-game instances, with the latter being featured at the start when X is in dismay from his failure to apprehend Vile, is far from lifeless and sluggish, as they both bring to the table an all new brand of tension and emotion unlike anything you've ever experienced before, I shit you not, and the same applies to the immensely intensified corresponding sound effects, which as dull as many make them out to be, are blessings sent from above that almost barely grate on your nerves whatsoever, and once again, take note of my top 10 in game songs displayed here, with a few select honorable mentions to back them up. Ability wise, must anything else be expressed that, yet again, hasn't already been done so time and time again? Other than the game's non linearity and opportunities to further explore and revisit previous areas, mostly due as a whole to the rising popularity in RPGs at the time? All these and more, including the traditional stage to stage pathway arrangement and strategy alternatives, are amongst many reasons to be warping back into this and the next two installments, if not so much regarding one of them. As a result, if you enjoyed the original classics, like many others have, yours truly included, I for one don't foresee any distinct impetus to even contemplate turning the big X down at all. Considering that both offerings continue right where their precursors left off, let's take each of their individual premises one step at a time without jumping the goddamn shark. Riley Scott 100 and Matt Michael, take it away. 
approximately half a year following the defeat of Sigma in the wake of the ever-sustaining Maverick Rebellion, X, now declared the leader of the still thriving Maverick Hunters, is dispatched to investigate an underground Maverick facility alongside a soon-to-be-eradicated comrade, only to find out that there's a secret group of Mavericks behind the operation. Enter the X-Hunters, Sergeus, Agile, and Violin, all of whom have recovered parts of Zero's body following his and X's confrontation with Vile last time around, and they're using them as bait to lure the main protagonist into their most elaborate trap yet. On top of that, another new cadre of eight Mavericks stationed throughout selected areas of the remote North Pole Island are out to ensure that his latest mission goes to total havoc. More like total havoc filled shit. In collaboration with this new trio of oppressors who also aim to resurrect the once fallen Sigma. And if that wasn't enough of a plot thickening exposition, notwithstanding the continuous efforts of X in then newly rebuilt and resurrected Comrade Zero, who by this point have their own HQ managed by Dr. Kane, even more maverick mayhem and anarchy has dramatically intensified over time, mostly thanks to the actions of other formerly stable reploids, also meeting the same foobar as balls fate in tandem with the other endlessly ruthless Maverick dipshits, but has eventually been neutralized by the latest reforming antivirus technology, courtesy of none other than Dr. Doppler, who had just recently built and established his own utopia-like society with the help of three other Reploids, namely Dopplertown. Or Doppeltown, as it's aptly dubbed. Just when all was right with the world, however, the brilliant, kind-hearted scientist and his followers revert back to their maverick personas, thereby starting way more shit than ever, even going so far as to lay waste upon the aforementioned Maverick Hunter HQ. Now, X and Zero are yet again out to put an immediate standstill to their catastrophic actions at any damn cost. Well elaborated, gentlemen. Tragically, due to Riley Sky 100's random sudden bailout, stemming from personal issues that dare not speak their name, it's about time I picked up the fucking pieces. Therefore, as always, why waste another precious second, right? Proceeding the exact same procedure from their foregoer, both outings start with their original intro stages, following which the habitual pick any one of the eight Mavericks and slaughter their anthropomorphic asses to nab their weapons operation takes place. In X2's case, you're infiltrating that very same underground factory upon the demise of that very same green-clad comrade whilst making scrap metal out of every mechanoid menace in your way, including the cannon driver, minus the likes in this stage's case, faraway gates, scribers, and scramblers, both made from scratch via the cabin machines, and appearing in the flesh, traversing over piles of junk with or without the use of the mecha arm, and even ascending up an enclosing pair of walls before reaching the culprit operating them, namely the slide aim. And trust us when we say this, you will be running into these same mechanoid adversaries down the road. And in X3's case, you're rating the Maverick Hunter HQ, both as X and Zero, the latter of whose role you'll also assume despite the limitations he carries, about which will be touched on eventually, taking down even more mechalinoid jackasses, running the gamut from the hopping Notor bangers, Genseki carriers, spy copters, except ones only seen at the beginning while X and Zero go to town on it, along with those in the background before starting, caterkillers, not to be confused with the segmented bug-like enemies from Sonic, Earth commanders, and even head gunners, appearing in at least one of two types, specifically the custom-designed rendition, of course, before facing the latter two, 
one of Doppler's servants, Mac, is seen starting all kinds of shit. While you're playing as X, you're left with no other recourse but to give in to his bullfuck demands and then... The baton of control is eventually turned over to Zero, who then saves X upon wiping out the dickhead and his magnetic hanger. Following these scenarios, a territorial boss confrontation arises involving the gigantic mechlinoid CF-0 in X2 and Mal the Giant in X3, who turn out to be complete pansy-ass bitches, notwithstanding their moderate levels of aggression. the bulky bastards and then it's onto our main rosters of mavericks waiting to have their sadomasochistic asses wiped off the face of the fucking earth and the locations that they reign in x2's case there's overdrive ostrich in the desert highway base wire sponge within the weather control facilities wheel gator aboard its dinosaur tank mobile crab within its deep sea base flame stag in the volcanic zone morph moth in the robot junkyard magnet centipede in the central computer station and finally crystal snail in the energy and crystal mine and for X3, your turn, Mad. Blizzard Buffalo at the ski resort. Toxic Seahorse in the wastewater dam. Tunnel Rhino at the construction quarry deposit. Volt Catfish in the power plant. Crush Crawfish near the shipyard. Neon Tiger within the urbanized jungle. Gravity Beetle within the aircraft carrier. And last but certainly not fucking least, Blast Hornet at the abandoned armory. And by now, the procedure should be second nature to us, considering that all the mandatory, if optional, items are discovered within them. Did I forget to mention that you can dash from the get-go in both offerings in addition to your rudimentary abilities, which again was to be the staple for future X entries? Well, the eight energy-expanding hearts and sub-tanks make their comeback, the usual armor enhancement capsules do as well, but with an all-new twist unlike anything anyone's ever imagined. Concerning those in X2, the helmet for targeting hidden secrets despite being incapable of firing any bursts, the X Buster Cannon for unleashing two fully charged blasts, with a second appearing when X flashes with a magenta aura, the body armor for absorbing damage like always from enemy attacks and converting them into energy for the all new Giga Crush Screen Nuke, with which X can raise all kinds of hell at any time, and the boots for performing mid air dashes horizontally are discovered in Crystal Snails, Wheel Gators, Morph Moths, and Overdrive Ostrich's domain singularly. And let's not forget about the return of the right armor attack carriers in Wheel Gator's area, and even the debut of the Ride chase or attack bike in Overdrive Ostrich's area before reaching the Sand Blaster, into which you're able to ram the latter featured vehicle to proceed, as well as coastal for spikes for easier access to the refill and one up items. As for X3, the new helmet for accessing a map of any previously conquered Maverick stage area, and thereby performing the same function as before, the new X Buster cannon for releasing more dynamic bursts, one of which appears in a wave with the others cross lapping in quick succession depending on your early timing. The new body armor reducing X's standard damage output by half, thus giving off an energy barrier as a sign of said function, except by three quarters, and the new boots for performing the same horizontal mid-air dashes, except there you can also pull one off upwards, are discovered in Tunnel Rhinos, Neon Tigers, Volt Catfishes, and Blizzard Buffalo's domains, also singularly. Also new to X3 are the level 2 armor enhancement chips found in purple capsules. Of course, you need the corresponding original enhancement for each of these ahead of time, and to top it off, you're only limited to equipping one of the possible four, and are forbidden from swapping out any of them. What kind of shit is that, right? As well as the gold armor, which fuses all the benefits these chips can have, the latter of which again will be elaborated momentarily. The energy chip for gradually replenishing your health while standing still for a reasonable time period. The X Buster chip for unleashing a ton of continuous charge shots minus the preliminary charge, but at the egregious cost of weapon energy. The body armor chip for performing the same function as the original, but at a much narrower fraction than ever. And the boot chip for performing two midair dashes in a row, no matter which direction you experiment with are discovered in Blast Hornets, Gravity Beetles, Crush Crawfishes, and Toxic Seahorses areas, respectively. And trust me when I say this, you'll need each of these enhancements as soon as you can find them and as long as you're aware of what sacrifices to make when it comes to deciding on which chips to equip yourself with. 
The Red Armor modules in X3 also make their one and only debut, and upon acquiring four of these, you can summon the corresponding Red Armor carriers via the power pedestals in each area the Hawk, Chimera, Frog, and Kangaroo. The only difference in how they handle stem from both their attack and travel capabilities, and the penultimate type is the only Red Armor that's waterproof, despite being limited to firing off homing mines and hopping on both land and under sea, hence its name. In other words, should you attempt to expose the other Red Armor carriers to water, they'll short circuit themselves to absolute dick all. Bottom line, don't even friggin' try it! Anyways, despite your freedom being limited to which of them are appropriate for a specific stage, the fact that these mechanic carrier suits are readily available to you provided the earlier recounted stipulations kicks serious ass and then fucking some. Regarding the sub bosses, upon dispatching the first two Mavericks in each offering's roster, the Effervescent X Hunter Trio in X2 and Doppler Servants in X3 bit and bite, warp in randomly to disperse their own brand of horseshit within the eight possible Maverick stage areas. And how can we possibly forget about the return of the infamous Vile? And to be exact, Vile Mark II. Let's just say that they'll wreck your shit and make you their forever bitch in less than half a minute if you're far from ready. Couldn't have said that any better, man. In order to bring Zero back with the three corresponding parts in X2, you'll have to confront and massacre the ever-loving shit out of the former announced group. Otherwise, it'll affect the outcome. Hell, they'll even reappear at another stage if you go through one initially determined area while ignoring one of the three still lurking within. Violin can be a bitch to handle, even with that constantly moving mace of his whose pattern will distract you to no foreseeable end whatsoever, but it's still a pushover regardless, even during the second encounter at the X Hunter's Fortress Area 1, during which he'll randomly summon support blocks for defense. Sarkis and Agile, however, can go eat a toad's testicles while getting feedbacked by Fulgore and Saberwolf from Rare's Killer Instinct. It's frustrating enough that the latter two X Hunter Cockknockers are more of a hair puller by comparison in terms of their respective patterns, considering they won't throw you off as much, like Sergei's mid air projectile arcs, the mines he constantly leaves behind, not to mention that post damage energy field of his that he generates while on his platform, and Agile's incredibly massive wave his Saber mix that puts even the Hao Shoko Ken from Art of Fighting and the Kaiser away from Fatal Fury 2 and KOF to the most unspeakable contempt that very few could put into words. In Tandem with his rapid flurry of strikes while dashing, but just you wait, they're even more relentless than the next two fortress areas. Getting back to those in X3, Bit and Bite are on the same aggression factor level, except there's a catch 22 to these dipshit droids. They'll return not only in the next three predetermined stages per sub boss following the first two, but likewise in Doppler's lab if you wipe them out with only your X Buster or fuse into a much tougher form if they're left alive upon your recent failure. Namely the Guy Car Machine Oinari. They won't return, however, if you cream the sons of bitches with their corresponding weakness weapons. Blizzard Buffalo's Frost Shield and Neon Tiger's Ray Splasher individually, thereby being replaced with a different boss per fortress area. The same applies with Vile, <coughs> it's Vile Mark II, whose optional confrontation is accessed within an abandoned underground factory via a hidden teleporter in any of the game's eight possible Maverick areas, this time in a Goliath ride armor, after which you'd have to escape said factory if you survive. Metroid anyone? Just like Bit and Bite, he'll also reappear in Doppler's lab in a more soul-crushing ride armor if you've only used the X-Buster on that Boba Fett wannabe shit for brains battle droid bastard or be replaced with a different boss if you take his ass out with his weakness. In this particular case, either the aforementioned Ray Slasher or Crush Crawfish's Spinning Blade. Before I forget, in order to switch to Zero at any time within the 8 Maverick stage areas, you have to first access the weapon and item menu by pausing, as always, and upon pressing L or R, a display will pop up informing you of his arrival. Unlike X, Zero's energy range is more expanded by comparison, considering it's the same as when you found and nabbed all 8 life hearts, and you can annihilate the Christ out of not only all the common enemies, but nearly send the most volatile, resilient bosses screaming far out into the motherfucking Mojave Desert with the use of his beam sapier after you've charged his weapon long enough. Take note, you're only allowed to summon him once per stage, and at the end of each of them, X will instantly warp back into the fray. And most importantly, if Zero dies, he won't be available again for the rest of the playthrough, thus affecting the game's outcome in the long run. I know, talk about Buzzkill City. Man, what a broken record I sound like. Concerning both titles, however, the controls are next to impeccable as always, despite the little to moderate grips many will become extremely agitated by, most notably the view in each area, unless you're fully aware of the unexpected horseshit they'll provide you with, the vastly enhanced enemy AI, and even the overall stage length, well in X3's case at least. The weapons you acquire from all the annihilated Maverick motherfuckers have their individual sets of pros and cons which works the same way as those from last time, and the gameplay procedure is still straightforward and vigorous, in spite of its redundant and jejune nature. Care to share your thoughts on the challenge, Matt? As opposed to their precursor, while X2 is still as moderate and tolerable as ever in that 
each of the stage structures, enemy and environmental hazard placements, and boss patterns are far from a myriad of head scratchers to get around in spite of the issues already discussed. I wouldn't so much as expect a fair shake from X3 if I were you, as it'll crush your skull wide open and feed every last fragment to the wolves. It's not just discovering and equipping every semi-mandatory item and or armor enhancement, let alone studying every goddamn stage structure with or without the new helmet enhancements, but rather hardwiring into one cerebrum the patterns of some, if quite possibly not all, the new Maverick bosses and especially the previously mentioned X-Hunter trio, bitten by and, and vile. vile Mark fucking two. In X2's case, I can wipe Overdrive Archer's ass out, no problem, even without his weakness, specifically Crystal Snail's Crystal Hunter, and pretty much work my way up the ramp, though the others are hardly justifiable to speculate on, in which case, always be equipped with the right weakness before reaching your desired target, again like the classic series. Hell, even Blizzard Buffalo and X3 isn't much of a problematic encounter by comparison, though that frigid fuckface can still throw you off guard at times with both the wall collisions and his standard two extreme ice-based attacks. And since we're on that subject in full honesty, the only few that ever drove me up a wall during several recent playthroughs were Wheel Gator, unless you were perceptive enough in terms of what kind of shit he'll pull next. Whether he whips out his spinning wheels or leaps out of his ocean of muck, thus chopping down on your ass if you're anywhere near him, Flame Stack due to his heightened agility and juxtaposition with his fire based offenses, and Magnus Centipede in X2, while sure you can use Morph Mod Silk Shot to obliterate his tail, he'll reappear in one corner hence his ninja like abilities, which is why I always, always anticipate and telegraph his motives beforehand, likewise with all the others. Whereas in the case of X3, Tunnel Rhino and Neon Tiger can both go piss up a flagpole due to the former's random halts whenever you change your trajectory whilst confronting him head on, and the latter's randomized race blaster shot and movement patterns individually. Other than that, even reaching the most faraway secrets can be more of a nightmare. I'm looking at you, hard tanks and crystal snails, and overdrive oxygen stage areas. <laughs> Likewise, with continuously farming your ass off to have all your sub tanks filled to the brim before reaching the final boss gauntlets. Speaking of which, while in Bubble Crab's deep sea area, slide down the wall when the sea canceller attack fish reaches the door, whip out and charge up Morph Mox Silk Shot upon reaching the secret room, and within seconds, a shitload of large energy capsules will appear out of nowhere. Therefore, expect an easy farmathon out of that. Getting back to what X3 can and will offer, remember the gold armor I discussed not too long ago? In Doppler's Lab Area 1, slide down the gap before the junk heap ramp, and within the secret area lies the fifth purple capsule, gaining you access to the enhancement, about whose benefits I highly advocate referring back to. And regarding Zero Saber, there are points when you can earn it, one of which is in Area 2 of Doppler's Lab, which the Mosquitous Miniboss starts all kinds of shit by nearly slaughtering Zero. That is, if you're playing as him and not X, hence one of the two possible outcomes yet to be touched on. And for your information, that would be Mosquitus. Thought I'd forget about the latest incarnations of Sigma, as well as all the other synthetic sausage dicks you have to overpower before reaching them? Guess the fuck again! In X2's case, as stated before, you have to refight the X-Hunter trio, not just violent again with the same old distracting as fuck mace and the randomly appearing support blocks, but also Sergei's in his ultralift vehicle with four destroyable turrets in front of him and at least two supporting platforms, and Agile in the most dynamic aircraft one's ever laid eyes on, sporting a volley of attack orbs, bombs, and rows of spike platforms that he releases when extremely pissed as fuck, followed by the boss rush involving the very same eight mavericks and separate teleporters, in the style of the classic series, two and onwards to be precise, with only four small energy capsules reappearing in between each encounter. <laughs> and depending on whether you've recovered Zero's parts or not, in the latter case, you'd have to fight the real Zero before confronting Sigma, sporting a serious Wolverine motif and a volley of electric sparks. Regarding the penultimate, the same Sigma encounter ensues right from the get-go after a plot twist involving the fake grey-colored Zero decoy annihilated by the very same real Zero, hence his trademark phrase displayed here. <laughs> Upon dealing with Sigma's first incarnation, his all-new CX4 holographic virus form makes its debut, which is susceptible to only Wire Sponge's strike chain and your fully charged X-Buster blasts. And you can refill yourself if need be thanks to the minions he summons. I mean, shit, Castlevania 4 much? In X3's case, however, 
the final stretch of events takes a different turn, as you're in Doppler's lab confronting the junk robot in the very same first area, whom you face if you've totally exterminated Bit and Byte with their corresponding weaknesses, as also stated previously. Which, to be perfectly honest, I, I never look forward to at all! An elephant-like machine that produces acid and will attempt to grab you and pull your ass in with its retracting arms while summoning junk via its supporting device and sending them off to the drill cylinders to the right of the conveyor belt on the bottom and occasionally hit the ground and fly back up. The Doppler Octopus in Area 2 within an underwater section, that is, if you've already made vile to your bitch, the usual eight Maverick refights via teleporter spiel followed by Dr. Doppler himself, whom you can only damage if he slightly lands following his attack, because doing so will partly refill his life. And finally, isn't it obvious? The return of Sigma. This time sporting something of a horned devil motif, except with a shield. Move over, Captain America. Take it easy there, Magnum P.I. He's susceptible to crush Crawfish's spinning blade, followed by his ultimate gargantuan, not to be fucked with, Kaiser form. Armed to the gills with mines, missiles, and a diagonal indigo murder beam that fires depending on your location, in which case either leap or plummet out of its volley range in advance. As ever, should you happen to sustain these respective outcomes, consider yourself in for one of the most refreshing, if a scotch somber, conclusions in gaming history, which for the record, transpires regardless of whether Zero was rebuilt or not. Though, in X3's case, the same shit comes into play following yet another escape sequence involving the rebirth of that very same holographic fuckboy virus from the previous encounter, leading up to his eventual subjugation by either Zero or Dr. Doppler, depending on whether or not the former is still alive. Beyond these, please refer to the same stipulations and restrictions regarding the previous X installment we exchanged, since it won't be echoed here, though the same number-based password system applies in both offerings, except with a 4x4 16-digit system, keeping track of not only how many Mavericks you've subdued, but also whether or not you've wiped out the new sub-bosses, the enhancements and items you've gained, and in x 2s case, how far you've made it within the X-Hunter's fortress areas, the Maverick teleportation room, or the final central computer confrontation with Sigma. The graphics are on an approximate par with their precursor, if slightly higher, given the all-new CX4 chip with which both games were equipped. Sure, the level hues haven't improved all that much, but at least the layouts and designs possess something of a dark motif, and are way more diversified, complete with more foreground and background detail, applied drastically this time around. The sprite work of the main characters and their opposing hostile parties have not only been recycled, but have been substantially complemented over time, including X himself, with or without the armor enhancements he discovers in terms of gearing up, and especially the aura hues he surrounds himself with when you charge the protagonist up for as long as possible before discharging his ultimate offenses, likewise with Zero and X3, as well as the beam saber that they use. While the CX-4's wireframe effects are dated and not as mind-blowing as it used to be, most notably the X in the title sequences, the holographic sword chop register in Magnus Centipede's area, and the spinning shurikane blade given off by the Genjibo in Blast Hornet's area in X2 and X3 singularly, and most notably Sigma in his virus form, my god were they sites for sore ass eyes, and a fucking groundbreaking slew of them I might add. Seriously, they shit on the likes of the entire Virtual Boy library any day, rest in peace Gunpei Yokoi. But here I am getting way too ahead of myself. While X3 doesn't offer much as opposed to X2, there's more depth than the parallax scrolling considering it's on about the same level as its two foregoers. Take Gravity Beetle Stage, for instance. Despite the incessant, if uncommon, slowdown and flickering occurring at certain intervals about which I'm in no position to reveal at this very moment, the overall presentation has undergone more befitting adjustments thanks to the combined efforts of Capcom and Minakuchi Engineering, and for the sake of bypassing any and all bullshit, won't leave you in the lurch for even one Christ-forsaken nanosecond. And as always, shit know this is piss all to do with the Adams Family, period. Your thoughts on the music and sound, Matt? Composed for both outings by the returning Yuki Iwai and Kunio Yamashita. Again, the latter of Castlevania fame alongside Satori Tarashima for Konami, as well as Power Blade 1 and 2 for Taito, Paki and Rocky 2 alongside Iwatsuki, Ohashi, and Yamao, Power Rangers on Super NES alongside Ikumi Tani for Bandai, with the latter four titles being developed by Natsumi on their behalf, and the penultimate also being published by them. Individually, while these songs aren't as memorable as last time, they do have their moments. Both X2 and X3 possess a deeper emphasis on light, serene synth rock and heavier grunge, individually, for better or worse. True, Mini might end up looking the other way regarding X3 due to its uninspiring and redundant nature, but as kick-ass as X2's choices of songs are, the latter installment's choices don't disappoint either. Then again, just like the graphics, you're better off observing, or listening in this case, and determining for yourself which themes stand out the most and which ones don't. And once again, take note of our top 8 songs shown here, with at least one honorable mention on the bottom.
replayability wise ranking a hair higher than their predecessor and notwithstanding the fact that just like the classic series these outings salvage the same rpg inspired elements while accompanying and implementing newer ones to the formula if not by much x2 and x3 are against all motherfucking odds definitely worth revisiting time and time again and are well worth every simoleon out there also a word of warning in terms of current pricing range compared to the original Mega Man X, which isn't as pricey as it used to be, its two follow-ups, whether loose or complete in box, are in serious highway robbery territory, running you $100 if possibly less, to an extremely overwhelming $689 if a skosh more. And goddamn was I lucky enough to snatch them both ahead of time. But in all seriousness, unless you're an avid collector like Garrus Julie, they're also available in the X Collection for both the PS2 and GameCube, along with the original Mega Man X and X4 through X6. Therefore, for those that wish to avoid breaking the bank, you're better off accessing them there. But then once again, other than that, why even bother leaving them out in the cold, right? <laughs> Next up, Mega Man 7, aka Rockman 7, a showdown of destiny. Bivol Cup, if you'll do the honors. Taking place a while following the events of the 6th NES offering, and definitely not those of the X spin-offs, hence the deceptive bullshit provided in magazines at the time, Dr. Wily, for the 6th time in a row, has been coming to grips regarding his countless plot setbacks resulting in our Blue Bomber hero's consecutive string of victories over the demented fuckbag mad scientist. In preparation for such an incident, he's gone out of his way to not only design and program another four new robot masters, but to ensure that they were sealed in special, top secret compartments and that they would reactivate themselves in search of their rightful creator should half a year pass without his inputs. During that cocksucking son of a bitch's incarceration period, however, several attempts at escape have failed, thus his wrinkly old ass had no other alternative but to wait it out. Six months, or precisely the aforestated half a year duration, of course have passed, and the four new rampaging robot masters wreak serious motherfucking havoc in a tireless search for their captive designer, alongside an all new mechanical menace of his. Therefore, like it's not obvious already, Mega's out to deal with those bionic bastards, and eventually cease and desist the Big W's bullfuck at any goddamn cost! Regarding the traditional run-of-the-mill gameplay, if you will, Biff. Theoretically, while the formula reflects those of its six predecessors, certain elements from the X spin-offs are implemented here. Case in point, we see not only our main hero and his housekeeper sister riding along with Light's new assistant, Otto, conversing about the obvious situation at hand, until they come across a point in the road beyond which the van's incapable of traveling. <laughs> It's at this very juncture when after a brief accessory malfunction... <laughs> Seriously, a Mets hard hat? Was Otto high on Sticklefritz when he supplied the helmets? Come on! Anyways, continue. Mega's out to dispense his own brand of justice, notwithstanding his far from impeccable timing. And then the inevitable siege ensues. Wiley finally flies the fucking coop from the ransacked Huskal, literally, thanks to the efforts of those previously discussed, pre-designed, pre-programmed punk-ass robot masters of his, with Dr. Light and Rush in tow. Of course, the hereditary intro stage proceeds as ever, fending off both the detaching bun -B tanks and the returning Mets, whilst advancing through the partly ruined urban landscape, complete with two territorial scuffles. 
With whom do you go against here, you might ask? First, there's that very same mechanical mad grinder menace from the intro sequence. Followed by the debut of Bass, aka Forte, who after going to town on his ass, reveals to us that he's also out to put Wily in his place alongside his own canine companion. Treble, aka Gospel. Coincidence much? Anyway, it's at this juncture when we're introduced to the first half of this particular offering's eight robot masters. Four in this case, with the next half being readily accessible upon retirement of the first four. Burst Man, Cloud Man, Junk Man, and Freeze Man. Followed by Slash Man, Spring Man, Turbo Man, not to be confused with that fictional wannabe superhero in the infamous Jingle All the Way, and Shade Man. Anyways, various elements from its six forerunners make their comeback here. For instance, the all new Super Adapter, a hybrid of both the jet power and transformations from the previous Mega Man outing, accessed by finding the letters spelling out R U S H in the first four Robot Masters areas, as well as the usual E tanks and the weapon tanks for refilling their respective sources and the S tanks for instantaneous replenishment of both sources, a la the M tank in 5 and the earlier cited Yashichi in 1, and regarding the former two types of recovery tanks. You can only carry up to no more than four of each. The Hyper Rocket Buster add-on for more enhanced homing capabilities in tandem with an expanded range while taking advantage of the Super Adapter, the Exit Model <clears throat> that would be the Exit Module for instantly warping out an already conquered stage area. Again, like an X, the return of Beat the Bird, except this time he's used for instantly rescuing Mega from sudden pitfalls, about whom I'll elaborate much later. The Energy Balancer and others, most of which can either A, be discovered in various stage areas on the fly, or with the aid of some of these add-ons, or B, bought from Otto's item replicator shop, accessed by pressing select on the Robot Master select screen, provided you're rounded up enough bolts for currency, like the P-chips and the Game Boy renditions of 4 and 5. New to this outing, however, is the rush search for discovering hidden items, as mentioned not too long ago. Even if it's any common refill, a random joke item, or plain dick all, acquired in Freeze Man stage, the aforementioned bolts gathered from already wiped out foes in your vicinity or found in plain sight. About whose purpose we highly advocate referring back to. And take note, while the smaller and larger bolt types are worth 2 and 8 individually, you can only carry up to as much as 999. Upon finding the Hypervolt in Springman stage, however, not only will Otto's items assembling job be further expedited, all the common items sold will have their respective prices diminished by half. And must we repeat ourselves over and over regarding the typical stage area procedures? Sure, there are a few new sub-bosses that make their appearances. For instance, let's not forget the Shiroku Machine GTV Polar Bears in Freeze Man stage, Kanagans, the Attack Crab in Burst Man stage, the Dominant King Gojulus T-Rex in Slash Man stage, the Van Pooken Pumpkin in Shade Man stage, as well as the Trucker Joe and the Living Mechanical Shishi Truck in Turbo Man stage. But it's the new gang of Robot Masters that take the lifetime fucking supply of cheese fondue and pulled pork with a tequila, Jägermeister, or a Malo on the side, thereby making the first 46 look like a goddamn school of pre-kindergartners. Trust us when we say this, not only will they make sure your ass doesn't last long enough to get past theirs, they'll do much more than tempt you to douse your goddamn controller in gasoline and incinerate that shit like it's no one's motherfucking beeswax! Well, maybe they're not that frustrating, considering the fact that they'll repeat their patterns upon subduing them with just their corresponding weakness weapons alone. X Syndrome, anyone? Well, the normal buster alone, that's an entirely different situation altogether. As ever, each new weapon is affixed to you when each of these droid douches are eliminated, namely the Freeze Cracker, Thunderbolt, Danger App, and Junk Shield, with our main protagonist giving a rundown of their rudimentary functions, joined by his rightful creator, EVERY GODDAMN TIME! So get used to these post-stage cutscenes, as they'll revolve around the same purpose, a lot, with some exceptions. Upon vanquishment of the first four Robot Masters, an intermission stage takes place in the Robot Museum, within which plaques and statues of your old adversaries from previous offerings make appearances. My god, talk about a proverbial trip down memory lane, right? Anyways, within the museum, you'll come across Wily once more, committing the heinous embezzlement of Gutsman, whom you'll face yet again later on, but in a different model, thereby leaving you with this clownbot cocksucker ally of his known as MASH, not to be confused with the wartime novel turned feature film turned dramedy TV series, whose weak point is its detachable noggin, which you'll put back together every once in a while following his brand of half ass theatrics. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Pair that Jester Jackass and of course the rest of the circus comes to town, no pun intended, in the form of the remaining 4 Robot Masters, whose names we once again suggest referring back to for the sake of circumventing any and all superfluity. By now, you pretty much get the fucking routine. Oh, and upon holding B and Starch simultaneously while picking Shade Man, consider yourself in for a most frightening surprise. Unnecessary hints aside, Proto Man will be making appearances in a few private stage areas to give helpful hints in your escapades, one of which involves the aforementioned Rush circuit panels. Take note, you must be encountered in one sitting during your playthroughs, without resetting or shutting off your console, since the password system keeps no record of these visitations. Should you happen to find him in all the secret areas, in addition to nabbing all the circuit panels no less, he'll then challenge you to a duel, just like in the third offering, during which you're better off using fully charged shots, as he'll also pull off his own at certain junctures. Overpower that rowdy, red-clad bastard and he'll bequeath you his new proto-shield, with which you can block certain projectiles while standing. Move over, Link. More tad biff? Control-wise, while it's still variable and on the up and up as ever, with or without the super adapter, and its semi-massive weight, I might add, it can be awkward and floaty at times in terms of mid-leap trajectory and anticipation strategies. Not to mention you'll always end up hovering diagonally upward in relation to the direction you're facing, regarding the former incident, unlike in 6. And to top it off, it can be a major pain in the cojones attempting to land picture-perfect shots or pull off any evasive maneuvers, unless your timing's undeniably impeccable beyond human distinction. Beyond those common gripes, it's far from an absolute hassle. Ditto for the drastically advanced yet traditional gameplay framework. Well, there you go. Nail on the fucking head. Care to share your thoughts on the challenge? In direct opposition to its six NES precursors, their five Game Boy variations, and especially the X spin-off installments, Seven somehow fairly balanced in terms of not only stage design and procedure rehashes, but the all-new gimmicks applied in juxtaposition with them. Take Burst Man's area, for instance. Upon exterminating Canagans, whom you'll face again later, by the by, the water's flow gradually levitates you while rows and columns of spikes appear above you. In which fucking case? Shift your ass away from them accordingly while tending to your necessities before reaching the surface. The instant deterioration of the fragile as shit ice platforms and freeze man stage when landing on them, especially before nabbing the H panel, the varying weather changes in Cloud Man's area, inspired by Wire Sponge's domain in X2 caused by subduing the Telltale escape droid, resulting in either a snowy setting with Freeze Man's freeze cracker or a rainy setting with any other weapon besides the former, thereby allowing you to see all or some of the mystery platforms ahead, individually. And don't even get me started with the Dark Area and Shade Man stage or the first Wily Fortress area, featuring the return of the track platforms, one might add. They always spin a mind-blowing 360 degrees to 1,800 degrees upon reaching the thinner sections on each structure. And notice how the lights always go out every time you stand on them. Within which, you're able to take advantage of the lighting-based visual cues while traversing through them, to name a decent number. Shifting gears back into the Beat the Bird while in Slash Man stage, burn down the last few trees using Turbo Man's Scorch Wheel and climb up the ladder leading to where he's locked in a cage. Upon dispatching said cage, Beat's eventually rescued and now you can summon him at will in order to negate sudden pitfalls, as discussed earlier. But only four times, and no, he won't be summoned for easier boss confrontations unlike in 5. Once more, for those that thought I'd forget about the 16-bit offerings variations of the Wily Fortress, let alone the events leading up to said milestone, consider yourself mistaken. When the 8th and final Robot Masters laid the fuck out, again with the other half's new string of weapons, specifically the Slash Claw, Wild Coil, Noise Crush, and an earlier stated Scorch Wheel, we then see our main eponymous hero warp back to Light's lab, and my dear gentle Jesus, what a total shit heap it is. Not only is the good-natured doctor down on his knees, Wiley pops up on the communication monitor laying down another revelation of sorts, that base and trouble were also his own original creations. Who, for the record, were the cause of all this goddamn mayhem? Serving as spies sent to eventually make the old Mega Meister their bitch. Despite what Base pointed out earlier, it's no wonder that scrotum-sucking anus brain was double-crossing him the entire time. No shit, Hercule Poirot. Therefore, within the aforementioned new Wily Fortress following said incident, other than most of the traditional stage-by-stage -stage trials and tribulations, an extremely relentless slew of altercations await within its forbidden interiors, including the often recounted base, both in its neutral form and fused together with his pet treble, hence his treble boost form, with the latter being a skosh tougher, in which case, always equip yourself with a super adapter in advance, as well as the very same returning Gutsman in Model G, except in the form of a rock-demolishing man-o-war, complete with an armed clamp. 
the giant fire-breathing Gamma Riser Turtle, also known for colliding into walls while withdrawing within its shell, and temporarily leaving behind a mini-compartment from which its offspring are dispatched. A gargantuan Oni-masked mystical flying skull by the name of Hanya Ned Squared, armed with missiles which are also used as platforms, by the by. Bombs hurled from its circular side hatches at the top, both displaying the kanji symbols Hisatsu, translated to Annihilation or Certain Kill. Yeah, like I never researched this shit enough? And a deadly as fuck laser beam discharged from its forehead. Also, you'll never guess where its weak point is. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Rob Riggle. And lastly, you've got the time honored Robot Master rematches, followed by yet another incarnation of both the Wily Machine, this time in the shape of a gigantic skull shaped walker that summons miniaturized replicas of itself. Okay, not going there. And the Wily Capsule. And holy fuck, is it considered by many to be the toughest final altercation yet! complete with the four energy orbs it discharges, each made up of a randomized element that'll do more than leave a serious dent on Mega's titanium hide, ice, fire, or electric, in tandem with the royal four sparks the demented, dark-hearted genius will release if you happen to land a perfect shot on this capsule. Before we go on any further, you can always access the Atom Replicator shop in between each area to restock your shit, which, need I remind everyone, is a fucking necessity, and your weapon energy is automatically refilled in between, unlike in the previous outings. As always, be prepared for a serious full-on pulse-pounding postscript should you manage to survive the latter two encounters, involving our eponymous Titanium Trooper reaching his breaking point in terms of setting Wily straight, thereby being left with no other expediency but to massacre his pitiful old ass, despite being quote-unquote more than a robot, as he so elegantly and concisely conveys without breaking a sweat. Then again, what robots do sweat anyway, right? eventually concluding with Basin Trouble's final appearance. And while we're at it, do keep in mind the same tips and tricks offered for every other offering examined so far, in conjunction with the usual 16-digit 4x4 square grid password system, with each number represented by a specific character, most notably 5 for all. Your opinions about the graphics, Biff? Taking into consideration that his offering was out over a year after the first MMX, and mere months between its two sequels, while Seven does borrow heavily from the likes of the X spin-offs, the general hue, choices, and presentation gimmicks are far from absolute eyesores, as many might expect. Granted, it's way too colorful, way too kid-friendly, and not very fortified as opposed to X, but once again, you've gotta hand it to Yoshihisa Suda, alongside Ryo Miyazaki, Kazunori Kadoi, <clears throat> that would be Kadoi, and Masayoshi Kurokawa, in bringing yet another contrasting selection of backgrounds to the table in conjunction with slightly maximizing the character sprite's sizes, with the help of the returning Inafune, IT'S INAFUNE, GODDAMMIT, alongside Hayato Kaji, to a plausible, if seldom them off-putting degree, thus sending those of the previous six NES installments and the five Game Boy counterparts combined screaming out into the Great Basin. Mega's newly rendered avatar, while radically improved, no pun intended, and more authentic this time around, can be extremely ponderous to handle, hence the earlier conveyed control gripes about which I'm in no position to go down ditto drive. Yeah, neither is yours truly. Everyone else, the newly introduced base and treble, auto, even the exclusive batch of foes, for instance, the Bomb Slay, Frisk Cannons, Gawk Roaches, Dust Crusher Worms, Tom Daddies, Astro Zombies, Windstorm Fan Fiends, Gillian Knights, Technodones, etc. <coughs> you mean Technodons? Isn't too frickin' shabby either. And nor are the new Robot Masters. Anyhow, notwithstanding the commonly raved about qualms about this current 16-bit offering's overall aesthetics, what better opportunity than right this second to declare a strong-willed, cast-iron belief that they're on the up-and-up with all the rest? In other words, they're modest and tolerable for its age. Well elaborated, Chief. As far as music and sound, with three of the five returning Alpha Lilo members taking the helm in the orchestration department, namely the aforementioned Takehara, Horiyama, and Tomozawa, alongside Ippo Yamada of Mega Man Zero 1 through 4 fame, while many might say that the soundtrack isn't on par with or as memorable as the likes of its much earlier NES precursors, and given the circumstances, no naive ass double standards intended, I'm in civil agreement here. I am, however, beyond any reasonable fucking doubt, going on record stating the antithesis. Sure, the majority of the tunes aren't enough to pop anyone's cherry or whet anyone's appetites after what X1 and 2 had to offer, instrumentation-wise, but they're rather exceptional in that they set the appropriate tones for every correlating incident, and then some. The sound effects are also in mixed bag territory, mostly in terms of Mega Man's rudimentary actions being peculiar and out of whack, thanks to their rather cartoonish nature compared to everything else, but they're not that much of a major gripe in my eyes. 
My top 8 songs from this installment are as follows. Basis theme, the Robot Master stage themes of Freeze Man, Burst Man, Turbo Man, and Shade Man, Wily's Fortress Areas 1 and 2, and the final Wily Capsule Battle, with an honorable mention aiming towards the Robot Museum, featuring a medley of earlier Robot Masters themes, specifically Snake Man, Guts Man, and Heat Man, from 3, 1, and 2, respectively. Your thoughts on the replay value, Biff? Just like with its sibling X franchise, there's always a shining light of opportunity to broaden your explorative desires and stock up on every crucial item thanks to the introduction of the bulk currency system, and especially the semi-counterproductive rush, rush search, not to mention the customary routine of telegraphing each end boss pattern as well as finding Proto Man at various intervals for optional hints. Mega Man 7, while rather flawed and not anything like 1 through 6 or X, is nothing short of a worthy expansion to the franchise thanks to the aforementioned scat of innovations, which I'm positive many are able to take advantage of, for better or for worse, at least. Ergo, and I'm expressing this out of respect for those that still detest the game, whom I don't blame in the least, but my ruling matters just as much either way. I see absolutely no definite point whatsoever in skipping over this much polarized 16-bit follow-up. <laughs>